When I got out of college, I needed a car. And I bought a Jaguar XK120M coupe. The thing was far more a work of art than a car. One of the most elegant, sleekest, lowest, raciest sports cars ever designed. Then I found out what I could do with it. The deep, sweet sound of the XK engine went straight to the center of my nervous system. Everything looked better, smelled better, tasted better, felt better. It was a revelation. We were to be allied in a great racing obsession. I would do whatever it took, but it was the adventure that appealed to me. When did you first get bitten with the bug? Whenever a girl wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor, when did you decide you wanted to be Mark Donahue? <laughs> well, it started with flying, of course. I didn't get into racing until I was well out of college. Finding out what lies beyond the blue horizon, whether it's geographically or whether it's a, a matter of human endeavor, has always been of great interest to me. Well, you know, when you're young, you uh, sort of try to figure out what your life is going to be like. And I did love adventure books. I loved Charles Lindbergh's book, The Spirit of St. Louis. I loved the adventure that the boys, and they were all boys in these books, had. I, I didn't want to be a boy, but I knew that I wanted to go out and have adventures myself. The first time flying, I was 13 years old. My father was a pilot. He gave me my first few lessons. I was 16 when I started wanting to parachute jump. I really loved it. There was never any feeling in our family that the girls were not going to go to college, but the boys were going to a small girls' school. Some of my classmates had that put on them by their parents, you know. No, you're not going to have a career. You are going to get married early. So I knew that existed, but uh, somehow I figured it didn't apply to me. <laughs> The 60s and 70s were critical times for the feminist movement. In 1963, the Equal Pay Act was passed. Then you had the following year, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which was supposed to prevent employment discrimination. So through all of this, men and women are really at odds with one another. Men feeling threatened and really wanting to hold their turf, and women feeling that they deserve equality in society. My education in the more virulent strains of sentiment toward women was underway. I had had the great good fortune of being brought up to believe that a woman could do whatever she chose. It was startling to discover how widespread was belief to the contrary. Had this been some 20 or 30 years later, I probably would have gone to fly for the airlines or in the military, but that was not a possibility for women at that point. So I picked aeronautical engineering. My first great passion was flying, but I found that sports car racing had the direct person-to-person -person competition, and that really put the cherry on top. I started out in Sports Car Club of America competition. I had my Jaguar XK120, and out I went on my first racing adventure. In the swinging 60s and 70s, I mean, America needed a top-line female racing driver, and Janet Guthrie was a model in that respect. She was quick and always very ambitious. Along the way, I had to learn how to build my own engines, do my own body work, because I really, really wanted to get to the next race. 
you know, sleeping in the back of the tow car, driving all night. Oh, to be out there at the frontiers of human experience, I loved it. She pushed herself hard. She worked hard. She was one of the boys. In sports car racing, being a woman, it just wasn't an issue. I was just another driver, which was how I liked it. My motivation was purely that of a racing driver. I was a racing driver right through to my bone marrow. By 1976, it had taken over my life, and I was really thinking that I had to come to my senses. I had no savings, no pension plan, no house, no health insurance, no stocks or bonds, no jewelry. My career in physics was eight years gone, hopelessly out of date. For 13 years, racing had been an obsession. The prospect of giving up loomed like a kind of death. That was when I got the totally unexpected phone call saying, how would you like to take a shot at the Indianapolis 500? To get a chance at the greatest race in the world, I would have walked on hot coals barefoot from New York to California. And so whatever came with the territory, I figured I could deal with. She was the first woman to try to make a major race in the United States on an oval, and there was so much controversy. What's your feeling about Janet Guthrie? A woman, to me, is John Teal, and you want to love her, and their physical makeup isn't for this sort of thing. Just to try to set it straight, is I have no feelings whatsoever about Janet one way or the other. I don't think any woman is going to make a good race driver. I just couldn't believe it. I'd been driving for 13 years at that point. All of a sudden, the newspapers are full of drivers saying, a woman on the track is going to kill us all. It was nonstop media. Every time she made a move up there, the, the press was just eating it alive. Well, Humpy was a promoter, of course, and the Charlotte newspapers were covering my adventures up in Indianapolis rather than Humpy's race. We are racing on the same day as the Indy 500. And it was also my first race to promote. And I was determined it's my first race. We're gonna sell out no matter what we gotta do. Humpy saw that things weren't going terribly well at Indianapolis, so he started putting up feelers about getting me down to Charlotte. Before Indy qualifying, I started calling her. I didn't want to know about it. As it got closer, I called her every day. Finally, she said, uh, if I don't make it up here, I want the best possible car I can get to run Charlotte. So when she didn't make it, I said, I'm gonna wait at least 45 minutes before I talk to her. The day after qualifying, we had struck a deal for me to drive my first ever NASCAR stock car race. Oh man, it was great. The press, they just poured out of Indy and followed her to Charlotte. <laughs> then it hit the fan. A day and a half after the devastating end of my great adventure at Indianapolis, I found myself standing in a different world, NASCAR land. In appearance and language, the Deep South was a world apart. There were no women in the sport at the time, and so that made her different, and it made a lot of people ask, you know, what does she think she's doing? Who does she think she is? A couple of the lead drivers had said she'll never make 600 miles. A woman can't do that. And I loved it because that, that meant that tickets were being sold. You know, it's definitely the good old boy's Southern sport. You know, it was tough. And Janet didn't have a background in cup races. These things weren't the easiest thing in the world to drive. So it was a big deal coming from the Indy cars to go try stock cars. On opening day of practice, the car was very nearly undrivable. And here comes Junior Johnson. Can you believe it? Junior Johnson, the last American hero of Tom Wolfe's essay, and asked Cale Yarbrough to take the car out and practice. And He'd gone only a little faster than I had. Junior looked at me 
and he said to his chief mechanic, give them the setup. And I finally had a drivable car in my hand. Sunday morning race day. We had the biggest day of single ticket sales that Charlotte Motor Speedway has ever had before or since because of the tremendous interest in Janet Guthrie. Women saw this as a historic moment for the women's movement. They weren't race fans. They wanted to see what this woman could do in a total all-male world. Janice, some of the other drivers said that uh, one of their worries was that you weren't physically uh, up to manhandling a 3,700-pound car. Well, that's, that's really just nonsense. You don't have to carry it. You just sit in it. And I, although it is certainly tiring, as anyone here will tell you, it is not beyond the capability of any reasonably fit woman. Before Janet, a lot of the women who had sort of broken that barrier were in situations where it wasn't real competition. Janet was unique in that she went out there and competed head to head. I wasn't doing it for women or for the women's cause. Like any racing driver, I was doing it for myself. 600 miles of Charlotte's a tough race. You would look at her and you'd say, are you sure you can make 600 miles at uh, Charlotte? There is Janet Guthrie, who is in 23rd position of the race. Been a lot of pressure on Janet Guthrie over here, a lot of publicity and so forth, but she's standing up to it very well. Charlotte 600 races are traditionally hot, so it was a pretty grueling 600 miles for anybody. I don't care if you're male or female, it didn't really matter. With 50 laps to go, the first woman driver in the history of this race is giving a good account of herself. This is Janet Guthrie in car number 68. As you see, she's still running on the hottest day possible and the longest race. She made the whole distance. Not only that, but she finished 15th. That was a pretty astounding feat, what she did that day. You know, this has got to go down to me, almost like Lindbergh going across the Atlantic because it had just never been done before. And she did it. She proved that you didn't have to have a 19-inch neck to be a race driver. I'd race with Janet Guthrie any time, said winner David Pearson, one of a million or so who said she wouldn't be able to stand up to 600 miles in a stock car on her first try. My own position was that of course women could do these things, and why in the world did anyone ever think otherwise? Well, It was clear to me that I really enjoyed NASCAR, but it took longer to become accepted in NASCAR Cup racing. It took solidly into 1977. I always wondered what it would be like. You got all these men, and, uh, and you show up and you're the only woman in the field. It has to be an odd feeling. I kind of went out of my way to help her because the thing I liked about her most, she was committed. She just wanted to drive a race car. I drove Janet's car in at Bristol. She was under the weather. And I do remember very well, like it was yesterday, lapping cars that were basically riding around trying to finish the race. And I remember with my car, they would always move out of the way, very courteous. They would get to the inside and give me the racetrack. And I was driving Janet, 68 Green Kelly Girl car. And I'm coming up on those same cars, and they would not get out of my way. I had to run up, bump a couple of them, you know, and move them out of the way, and they'd shake their fist at me, and, you know, they're thinking I'm Janet in the car. And I thought that day when I finished, I said, man, this poor woman, she's racing twice as hard as everybody else because, you know, nobody wanted to be passed by a girl. There's an expression for women who have worked in sport that you have to be twice as good to get half the amount of credit. And I think that that expression applies here in just how amazing it was for Janet to be successful in both open wheel and stock car at a time when women weren't considered to be able to do it at all. In 1977, I was the first woman to make the field for the Daytona 500, and also the first woman to make the field for the Indianapolis 500. And that wasn't what I was interested in. I was interested in winning the races, but I knew that if I screwed up, another woman wasn't going to get a chance for a long time. 
from one town to another. <laughs> I know. There were some women that had driven cars early on in NASCAR, but no one had come along and quite had the impact that Janet did. She's a trailblazer. And I think it just showed other females, if you really are committed and you really want to do this, then this is what you can accomplish. Her helmet and driver's suit hang in the Smithsonian Institution. And folks, quite honestly, I think it's time we recognize her achievements and give her a great big applause for Janet Guthrie. I was so thrilled when I was inducted into the International Motorsports Hall of Fame. I did ask Terrell Waltrip to introduce me. What little help I gave her. I was flattered that she remembered that. That meant a lot to me. She saw it that night that she had been accepted into the worldwide ranks of really good racers. Long before I got my chance at the top levels, a famous French racing driver was being interviewed and uh, someone asked him what he thought the chances would be of women in racing. And he replied, oh, I don't think they would be very good. I think they would be missing something between the legs. Um, I never understood the utility of that apparatus in driving a race car. Although the amazing honors are touching and humbling, I would give them all up for the chance to go back to 1980 and start my 34th NASCAR Cup race. Thank you. In 1980, I no longer had a full-time ride. That was basically the end of my top-level racing career. So I started on my book. It was not ghost-written. The whole thing was mine. How can I possibly explain how much I loved this sport, or why? When you're a kid, you sometimes have dreams in which your childish wishes are granted beyond imagining. I lived that dream. Oh my lord, look at that. Where did that come from? <laughs> ah, beauty. This is the kind of car that I started racing in in 1963. That just thrills me to see one again. If I contributed some small bit to the changing perception of women's abilities, I am glad of that. It was not the reason that I did what I did. I drove race cars because I could not do otherwise, because it was an obsession and a passion. Not everyone wants to drive race cars, but for each person, the right challenge is out there. The challenge that is just the right size. The challenge that will evoke a great adventure.